uh, good evening. A very warm welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival and to this event, which is sponsored by the British Academy. My name's Rosemary Goring. I'm, I usually just check to make sure I'm in the right tent, so this is mm. very reassuring. Yeah. It's my great pleasure to be here to introduce Professor Sir David Canadine, one of the most eminent and eminently readable historians of our times. David, who was born in Birmingham, is Dodge Professor of History at Princeton University, visiting professor at Oxford University, and president of the British Academy. He's also editor of the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. He's a general editor of the prestigious Penguin History of Europe series and the Penguin History of Britain. And his latest book, from which his talk this evening is going to be based, is called Victorious Century, and that was written as part of that series. It's a really astonishing book, a work of erudition, a kind of university education in one volume. It's a galloping, colourful, brilliantly concise read, and it shows the political and cultural scaffolding out of which the 19th century was built, from the 1800 Acts of Union, which brought Ireland into the United Kingdom, to 19, sorry, 1906, when the Liberals enjoyed a landslide victory. Will that ever happen again? It was the best of times and it was the worst of times, as Dickens wrote. Industry boomed and our colonies covered the globe, and yet poverty blighted the entire century. Despite this, as David writes, and I'm quoting here, these were the years when many of the things that we still take for granted today first came into being. Among them, and this I think is a fantastic list, stamps, photographs, bicycles, football, telephones, sewers, nurses, policemen, detectives, department stores, matches, museums and galleries, red brick universities, restaurants, detective novels, bacon and eggs, golf, tennis, the National Trust and the old school tie. And as David says, in many ways, even today, the British 19th century is still not yet over. Now, um, <laughs> if, you, if you live where I live, you really would, would sort of respond to that. Um, two, two things. Firstly, just in the housekeeping thing, apparently we're not allowed to take photos or any recordings. And if anybody wants to tweet, you're very welcome, but I'm afraid you have to wait till the end when the lights go up for questions. David is now going to give a talk which is based on historical perspectives on Brexit. So frankly, this is edge of the seat stuff. Um, he's going to be talking for about 40, 45 minutes, after which I'll say very little before throwing it open to the floor. Um, so this could not be a better evening, I think, for all of us. So David, I hand over to you now. Thank you. <laughs> Rosemary, thank you so much for those immensely kind and generous words, far more kind and generous than I could possibly deserve. Um, I ought to say that, um, unlike someone else who uh, introduced me, who said, uh, David has written a new book. Um, it's called Victoria's Secret. Um, <laughs> It's just the boost the lingerie industry needs. <laughs> so thank you for not uh, having said uh, that. Um, it's a huge pleasure to be here and to be back at this most splendid and preeminent uh, of all uh, literary festivals. And it's a particular pleasure because, of course, uh, the British Academy has now this long-standing connection and association with this festival. Uh, I think uh, this festival, like the British Academy, uh, believes in reason and truth and evidence-based learning and the free trade uh, in ideas and the Republic of Letters and a whole variety of other, as it seems to me, extremely admirable and, alas, at the moment, all too often threatened values. And so I'm here today not only uh, to acclaim what goes on here at this festival and to express thanks for uh, giving the British Academy this opportunity to associate with it, but also to declare the Academy's strong belief in all those absolutely important and enormously essential values uh, that this festival certainly stands for, that this great city, uh, one of the most enlightened cities in the world in every possible sense of that phrase, has also stood for for such a long time. So it's a huge pleasure to be here and to be able uh, to say that. When I uh, apply my trade by speaking as well as by writing, um, I sometimes introduce myself to people who have never heard of me, and I say to them, um, I'm a historian. And sometimes they then contradict their claim not to have heard of me by saying, I know, in a rather ominous way. Um, or even worse, they say, I am so very, very, very sorry. 
um, which has never uh, cheered me up at all. Anyway, I hope that what I'm about to say tonight uh, will not uh, make you uh, sorry at all. When I chose this title, which was Understanding the United Kingdom, the subtitle for which was Some Thoughts on Brexit, I chose it either late last year or very early this year, and I naturally supposed that by the time I came here, Brexit would all be sorted and done. Um, <laughs> And like all historians, I could be wise after the event and explain to you why it had all worked out the way it had. Well, of course, the problem is it hasn't worked out at all. Um, we're still at it, uh, or alternatively not at it, depending on who you talk to and which newspaper you read. Um, so it is still uh, a very hot issue, to put it mildly. Uh, the outcome is not at all clear. Uh, disagreements are deep and passions run uh, high. And I suppose there may be some disagreement and passion vented or displayed when we get to the questions and comments here. It is, of course, an issue on which I have my own views, such as they are. I recognise that other people have views that are different from mine. And on the whole, healthy democracies require people to have different views and to disagree, although perhaps with more courtesy than has been much in evidence of late. Uh, there are doubtless many different views uh, on offer in this audience uh, this evening. And of course, I also accept very much that the view of Brexit uh, and the view of what the government is or isn't doing in London at the moment must be very different from here in Edinburgh and in Scotland more broadly than it is uh, in England itself. So in the light of all of those kind of caveats and complications and warnings, all I can really do this evening is hope to offer some reflections, not on how and why Brexit came out the way it did, but rather as to how and why we have got to where we are, and some more general reflections which might set things in context. But although I do the past professionally, and I live in the present, I'm very anxious to say I really don't do the future. Um, and I think it would be very unwise for anybody to try to hazard a, a view as to what's going to happen. I don't think Boris Johnson knows, and if he doesn't know, how can the rest of us possibly know? I should also say that although it is my great pleasure and privilege to be president of the British Academy, uh, I am, of course, speaking tonight in a wholly personal capacity. Uh, the British Academy very properly numbers among its extremely distinguished fellows, Brexiteers, Remainers, and indeed Brexiteers of all views and Remainers of all views as well. So uh, these are, as it were, my own thoughts for what they are worth. I shall try in the process to be as even-handed as I can, though I suspect by the time I come to an end, it'll be pretty clear what my own views are. I want to group my comments, if I may, under three uh, headings. I've never been able to give lectures without three headings. Two never seems enough, and four is too many, so it's here we are with three. Uh, and I want to offer, first of all, some kind of deep historical background, which perhaps offers some perspectives on our current uh, circumstances. I then want to offer different perspectives on our current circumstances, which I shall call contingency and accident. Uh, and then I'm going to offer some final reflections and probably provocations. So let me start, if I may, with deep historical background. And I begin with a quotation uh, from Dean Asherson, uh, Harry Truman's Secretary of State and one of the prime architects of the post-1945 world order the Order of Martial Aid, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, NATO, and the United Nations. Uh, a world order, uh, rule-governed, multinational, with a set of great institutions which, to a considerable degree, have preserved the peace and brought a fair amount of prosperity uh, since the end of the Second World War. And early in the 1960s, Asherson, previously thought to be an ardent Anglophile, uh, made the following observation. Great Britain has lost an empire and not yet found a new role in the world. And I'm old enough to remember that that remark caused a huge amount of trouble in London at the time. And it caused trouble because it was true. <laughs> As any author will tell you, reviews uh, that are irrelevant uh, don't matter. Reviews that offer criticisms that are not appropriate to the book don't matter. Uh, the criticism that causes annoyance is a criticism that's true. And Asherson's remark was absolutely true. And what it spoke to, essentially, was that in the 19th century, the United Kingdom had made a great empire. In the 20th century, uh, and certainly in the 1960s, it was in the process of losing it and seeking to find another role. 
And in the 21st century, it seems to me the United Kingdom, parts of it, is still in many ways in thrall to what is often, I think, a much oversimplified and even caricatured version of that earlier imperial past, as inspired by or intimidated by these often very vulgar versions of this earlier imperial past, it continues to search for a world role. Whether indeed it ought to be searching for a world role at all is, of course, another question that we might want to get to later as well. Well, how should we think about all of that? And how does that get us uh, by one route, uh, the route of deep historical background, uh, to Brexit uh, here now, as it were, today? And the starting point here, uh, mentioned in fact in my book, indeed my book is much about this, uh, is that in the 19th century, the United Kingdom, uh, including Ireland after 1800 and 1801, became the world's foremost industrial, financial, maritime and imperial power. As a result of which, a small group of islands began to exercise a wholly disproportionate influence on the affairs of the world. And of course, like all global hegemons, the British believed that this was a preordained thing, that it was a predestined outcome, that God was an Englishman. What other language could God possibly think of speaking except English or maybe Scottish? As Cecil Rhodes once observed to someone who told him he was English, young man, you have won first prize in the lottery of life. Or, as Rhodes said on another occasion, the British are the finest nation and race in the world, and the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for mankind. Mankind's views were not, I have to say, canvassed about that, but that was Rhodes's view. But there is a sense in which it was all a fluke. And that, in a way, is perhaps the most important point uh, I certainly want to make in the first part of this lecture. Uh, Britain industrialised first, which put it way ahead of any other global competitors for the best part of two or three uh, generations. Uh, it did not involve itself in the continent after 1815. Uh, America was divided by civil war. Russia was backward. Germany did not yet exist. And there was a sense in which there was therefore no plausible rival to Britain as a global hegemon. And Britain was able to create what John Darwin called a world system built around the Indian Empire, the so-called white dominions, the tropical colonies, a huge sense of financial power in London, financing so much of the rest of the world, uh, the largest uh, navy in the world, both the Royal Navy and the Merchant Marine. Uh, and a large area of informal empire, especially in Latin America, where uh, most of the utilities and most of the railways were owned by the British. And so the British were able to become a global hegemon in the 19th century, partly by default. There was no real competition until the closing decades of the 19th century. And they were able to do it on the cheap. Because the, the navy didn't cost much until you have to start building dreadnoughts in the early 20th century. The navy was cheap. And the mechanisms of rule were also very inexpensive. So it was a shoestring empire that the British created in the 19th century, partly because they had industrialized first, but largely because the global circumstances were extraordinarily propitious in a way that had, in a sense, nothing to do with the British themselves. And this notion that the 19th century is therefore the natural state of affairs for Britain, from which there has been since a deplorable and regrettable decline, and to which we should seek to return because that's how it was and how it ought to be, seems to be historically completely misconceived. And the evidence of that is, as it were, the evidence of the 20th century. In the late 19th and early 20th century, things got much harder for Britain. With the rise of a unified and extremely productive Germany, with, of course, a great navy. With the rise of the fabulously rich and powerful United States, both a land-based empire across the whole of North America and a maritime empire as well, also with a very large navy. With the rise of Japan in the late 19th and early 20th century and on through until the Second World War, a very powerful, modern, industrializing, westernized economy off the coast of Asia, 
with a very strong navy and a very strong army, and eventually, of course, to the rise of communist Russia. These were either bigger countries or very prosperous countries, and they were, and they became a big threat economically and diplomatically and militarily to this vast and arguably overstretched and overextended British world system that the British had been able to create due to these extraordinarily flukish circumstances in the 19th century. And so the great question facing British statesmen, and they were all men at this time, during the first half of the 20th century and beginning in the increasing tensions and anxieties of the, the 1890s, was how could Britain retain, in an era of increasing great power competition, that great power hegemony that it had won in an age of monopoly, and an age, as I've suggested, of flukish monopoly. And the answer was, of course, that it couldn't. Of course, Britain was on the winning side in the First World War, but the financial help of the United States was absolutely essential. By 1917, Britain was practically bankrupt, and in the end, the military support of the United, Na of the United States was uh, essential as well. To make matters worse, of course, the British Empire actually got bitter, bigger after the First World War with the acquisition of the League of Nations mandates in the Middle East, uh, in Jordan, in Iraq, and in what became Palestine, subsequently Israel, and in German East Africa, subsequently Tanganyika. <laughs> and so the problem facing the British in the aftermath of the First World War was it had a very weak economy because the First World War had been so expensive. It owed America a lot of debt, uh, its industrial infrastructure was old, dated, uh, and increasingly uh, incapable of competing with much more modern economies elsewhere, and there was very, li very limited money available to spend on defence uh, in terms of the Navy, the Army, and of course the Singapore naval base. So what the British Empire was suffering from by the 1920s and 30s was that it was overextended and it was underpowered and underfinanced. And in the Second World War, the chickens came home to roost. Facing trouble, as the United Kingdom and British Empire did in the Far East, in the Mediterranean, in North Africa, in Europe, and in the Atlantic, simultaneously. And the great motive for appeasement in the 1930s was that policymakers were aware that this could be the nightmare scenario. And the motive for trying to appease Hitler uh, or Mussolini was to try to fend off at least some of these potential threats. Now, uh, of course it's the case that Britain produces magnificent defiance under Churchill's leadership. Uh, Max Hastings, who I think has performed earlier this afternoon in his book on Churchill, says it's impossible not to be overwhelmed by the sustained magnificence of Churchill's performance from 1940 to 45. But the reason it was such an extraordinary performance was because Churchill was always playing a very weak hand. Not least because between 1940 and 1942, that whole British world system, financial, military, imperial, essentially collapses. Now eventually the pieces were put back together after a fashion. But in order for the pieces to be put back together, Britain needed the help of the United States in the Pacific and of Russia in Eastern Europe. And it's their overwhelming military might which eventually defeats Japan and Germany uh, and Italy. They are the big winners, those two. A.J.P. Taylor once said that the Second World War was really the war of British succession. Who would succeed Britain as the greatest power in the world? And the answer, of course, is America uh, and uh, communist Russia. And one of the other ways in which it's possible and appropriate to acclaim the sustained magnificence of Churchill's performance in the Second World War is that those two allies, the United States and Communist Russia, which are absolutely essential if Britain is not only uh, to survive the Second World War but to be on the winning side, were themselves not actually very friendly to Britain at all. Roosevelt did not really like Churchill, who he thought was a Victorian imperialist reactionary, and Roosevelt had very strong predatory designs on the British Empire, was constantly pushing Churchill to advance India to self-government. And, of course, the Russians didn't like Churchill because he was vehemently anti-Bolshevik. 
So when, at the Lord Mayor's banquet, uh, halfway through the Second World War, Churchill says, I have not become the King's First Minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. Those remarks were not only addressed, uh, as it were, to Berlin and to Rome and to Tokyo, but to Moscow and Washington as well. And it's one of Churchill's extraordinary achievements that he managed to make that alliance work, and that as a result of it all, in 1945, the pieces were put back together. Uh, the British Empire uh, survived, uh, the parts that the Japanese had overrun were won back, and indeed for a brief time the British Empire was even extended further because of the British zone uh, in occupied Germany. But by 1945, it was essentially living on borrowed time. Uh, the British Empire was really, after that, an unsustainable enterprise, as, of course, were all of the other European empires as well. And it's important to remember that although the British Empire was the greatest, it wasn't the only one. India, of course, becomes independent in 1947, and that's the end of the great Disraelian romance about uh, the mysterious East and about making Britain an Asiatic power as well as a European one. Uh, most of the rest of the colonial empire in Africa and Asia had gone by the 1960s, and those English-speaking dominions, which had been so crucial uh, for the First and Second World War efforts, essentially moved out of the British financial and strategic orbit. Canada to the United States, uh, Australia and New Zealand to the United States, and South Africa, of course, left the Commonwealth altogether. Churchill's funeral in 1965, therefore, was not only the last rites of the great man himself, but it was self-consciously understood at the time as a requiem for Britain as a great power. And Churchill himself, uh, in old age, uh, did observe on one occasion, I have achieved so much to have achieved in the end nothing probably the saddest remark ever made by a great man in extremist, but what he meant by that was that his life effort had been to protect and preserve and sustain the British Empire and Britain as a great power, and even he knew by the early 1960s that it was over. Of course, something was invented called the Commonwealth, uh, and the claim was subsequently made that the whole purpose of the British Empire was that it should become the Commonwealth, but that was a pretty fanciful rewriting of history, to put it mildly. And the Commonwealth is essentially a kind of alumni association of the British Empire, uh, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, and whereas the British Empire was about power, the Commonwealth is really all about sentiment uh, and all about the Queen. Well, that is the context in the early 1960s and the, as it were, historical backstory that I've unfolded uh, rather rapidly. That's the context within which Dean Asherson made his remarks. And that also explains, in a sense, why he was right. By the early 1960s, it was over for the British Empire. It was through the empire that Britain had been able to punch above its weight and perform as a great power. The end of the empire meant that that strategy, that mode of operation, was over. So what to do instead? And, of course, it was in that context, and the timing is absolutely plain, that Britain launched its bid to join what was then called the common market, subsequently the European Union. And joining what was then, as a shorthand phrase, called Europe, was seen as the solution to Asherson's jibe. That Europe would be the new role. Britain would turn its back on such residual loyalty as remained, especially in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and it would turn away from the empire, from the oceans, and it would commit itself uh, to Europe. The influence Britain had gained through being a great power was over, but there would be a new area in which Britain could work and through which it could again exercise a disproportionate amount of influence, disproportionate to its own relatively exiguous size, through closer association with Europe. And Harold Macmillan, uh, the man responsible for winding up much of the British Empire in the late 1950s and early 1960s, it was Macmillan who spotted that that was the answer to Asherson's question. The empire's on the way out. Joining Europe is a new beginning, a new arena through which Britain can exercise a much greater degree of influence than it would just on its own. And, of course, it was under uh, Macmillan's uh, successor, but two, as Conservative Prime Minister uh, Edward Heath, that, in the end, Britain did after de Gaulle's earlier veto, actually join the EU. And it's fair to say that that 
connection has brought with it considerable benefits of influence, uh, of leadership, uh, of cultural interaction, uh, of a great deal of work uh, in terms of science and research in the humanities and social sciences. Um, and although this isn't a point that's often made, many of the nations of Europe, at least until recent events, felt that the U European Union had been greatly strengthened by Britain's adhesion to it, and that Britain in turn had also been similarly strengthened. So from this perspective, the common market subsequently EU delivered peace and prosperity and progress, and for much of the time, from uh, the, the time of Edward Heath on, Britain has been both the proponent and the beneficiary of those developments. And that appeared for more than a generation to be the answer to Asherson's question. However, as Arthur Schlesinger once said, the future compounds all our certainties. And it's a phrase that we certainly ought to be taking note of, especially today. As it were, what appeared to be the fixed nature of this successfully created alternative, imperial hegemony was given up, close ties to Europe were embraced instead, which looked pretty permanent. Remember, the Good Friday Agreement negotiated in the 1990s took it for granted that, Europe, that the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland would forever be members of the EU. But of course, the Brexit referendum has turned out to be a rejection of that deal and of that arrangement. Uh, the will of the people, so we are constantly uh, being told, has uh, expressed itself and has rejected this solution to Dean Asherson's problem on the basis that membership of the EU brings more disadvantages than benefits, that it's more constraining than it is liberating, uh, that it's a prison, not an opportunity. Uh, or indeed, if Ann Widdicombe is to be believed, it's not only subservience, but it's even slavery as well. And there are two different versions of this, as it's now presented, utterly regrettable and mistaken wrong turning that was taken uh, in the 1960s and 70s. For the right, Brussels and the EU are seen as a wicked bureaucratic plot that Brussels is run by an anti-democratic group of self-perpetuating administrators, and not only self-perpetuating, but self-regarding as well. And that the task of creative and patriotic British statesmanship is to emancipate ourselves from the thraldom of the dead or devious or malevolent hand of Brussels, so that the Thatcherite free market capitalist revolution can be completed. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is very much the view, for example, of Nigel Lawson. But here's another very different take on it, that, which comes from the left, that far from being a bureaucratic plot, the common market is a capitalist plot. It's run uh, by wicked, irresponsible, money-grubbing, profit-grasping businessmen. And that the purpose of Brexit is to emancipate ourselves from the thraldom of these appalling people uh, so that global capitalism can be rejected and the socialist revolution uh, can be carried out uh, and Jeremy Corbyn will be in 10 Downing Street. Well, they can't both be right, it's fair to say. I mean, they are utterly different visions of what is going on uh, and they don't uh, seem to me to be particularly well informed in either case. But either way, and those are very much the two arguments that are on offer. The argument uh, that the common market and the subsequent European Union would give Britain a new role and a new opportunity has not convinced. So part of our current uncertainties and discontents, it seems to me, and anxieties are, all right, uh, Europe has not worked as the answer to Asherson's challenge. So what's next? Since there is still a belief that Britain ought to punch above its weight, needs to punch above its weight, and can and should punch above its weight, an argument which perhaps does deserve some rather critical examination, which it rarely gets, the empire's gone. That was one way to do it. We've had it with Europe. That was another way to do it. What's next? And the answer that we are given is global Britain. That's, as it were, the third attempt uh, to punch above our weight, the first one having gone and the second one having been rejected by uh, the electorate. 
And according to this argument, Britain will become the Singapore of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it will re-establish uh, its connections with the old Commonwealth, that's to say Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and maybe South Africa. Uh, the special relationship uh, will be revived, um, and this is going to offer a whole new and wider future uh, which will be much more exhilarating and much more exciting than continued subservience either to the wicked bureaucrats or the selfish capitalists who are running uh, the EU. Well, uh, will it work? Uh, well, we don't yet know, uh, though I suppose it's probably going to be the case that we are going to have to find out. Um, it does seem to me that I think the argument about recreating a kind of global uh, shadow British Empire is not exactly fully worked out, and I'm bound to say that on the basis of Mr. Trump's treatment of our previous ambassador to Washington, I wouldn't myself hold out too much hope uh, of a revived uh, special relationship, or at least uh, I wouldn't uh, expect that the terms on which the special relationship might be revived would necessarily be to Britain's advantage. So that seems to me to be, as it were, where we've been and where we are and what the options are uh, going forward. Historians, of course, love to look for deep-rooted causes of things because the more deep-rooted causes of things you can find, the more historians you need to try to find them. <laughs> um, and so we're all up for that. Um, and the account that I've just given is full of deep-rooted causes, which don't seem to me to be irrelevant to trying to understand uh, our current circumstances. We do, I think, need to understand the current Brexit issue in terms of both the realities and perhaps the delusions of Britain's 19th to 21st century histories and aspirations regarding its great power status. I think it's undeniable that in some ways Brexit is a response to a growing sense of national decline post-Thatcher, and also to a sense in many parts of the United Kingdom of being left behind on a more personal level in deindustrialized parts of the United Kingdom and in agricultural areas too. Brexit, it seems to me in that sense, is a protest against all that and a belief that national decline uh, can be halted and reversed, that Britain wants and deserves to be a big player in the world and that there must surely be a new way of doing that. Well, those are significant arguments which certainly seem to me to be uh, partly to uh, help explain where we've got to. But let me now offer a very different approach to trying to explain and understand, or at least set in context, um, what's been going on. And that is, uh, I want to look at what I want to call contingency and accident, which often seem to me to be enormously important in explaining why historical things go on. But historians don't like admitting that because you don't, you you don't need a lot of historians to explain contingency and accident because it just happens. Um, whereas you do need lots of historians to explain deep-rooted causes. And so historians are actually very uncomfortable with contingency and accident. And the most famous historian to be uncomfortable with contingency and accident was a very great French historian, Fernand Brodel. Brodel believed that history was driven fundamentally by deep underlying causes, that they were the big and important stuff, the long durée, as he called it. And we have quite a long durée, it seems to me, of 19th, 20th, and now 21st century history, which is important in understanding Brexit that I've tried to summarise uh, too rapidly, but I hope not wholly misleadingly. And for Brodel, that was the stuff that mattered if you wanted to understand the way the historical process worked. And the thing to which you should not give any serious attention was, by contrast, what he called histoire évonimentielle. The flotsam and jetsam of high politics, the women caprice of individual personalities and motivations and rivalries. That that stuff didn't really matter at all. That that was all irrelevant to trying to understand what really drove the historical process forward. Well, as I've attempted to argue in the first part of what I've been saying, I do think that the long durée, the deep underlying causes, do offer a lot of insights on Brexit. But I also want to say, contrary to Brodel, that actually so does an understanding, an examination uh, of contingency and accident as well. And we hardly need surely reminding of that, given that we have had three years of contingency and accident, um, and it's not over yet. And so I offer different uh, quotations this time. Macmillan, when, someone once said to Harold Macmillan, 
what's the greatest risk and worry that you have as Prime Minister? And Macmillan, having been educated at Oxford University, replied, events, dear boy, events. <laughs> but Yvonne Montiel did matter. Donald Rumsfeld, having been educated by contrast at Princeton, put it more pithily when he simply said, stuff happens. <laughs> well, a lot of stuff has been happening. There's been a lot of events over the last three years or so at a very high political level, which can indeed, I think, uh, be recognised as themselves playing into uh, the Brexit imbroglio in which we find ourselves now. And let me, to make this case, offer some interesting counterfactuals that could possibly have occurred. Consider, for example, the following. If Margaret Thatcher had been followed by Michael Heseltine instead of by John Major, and if Michael Heseltine had been followed by Ken Clark, it might all have been very different. The Eurosceptics would never have become so important in the Tory party, and Europe would never have become a major issue, even as late as 2010, it wasn't really a big issue. Cameron would never have been Prime Minister, there would never have been a referendum, and the choice of the Tory leader, and most recently Prime Minister, would not have been handed over to the Conservative rank and file, otherwise known as the readers of the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> in other words, if this alternative set of political events had happened, which could possibly have happened, we would not be where we are now. Uh, with a Tory party increasingly, and I'm quoting Chris Patton here, who is, of course, a former Tory cabinet minister, a party uh, obsessed above all else uh, with Little England, and Boris Johnson would not be prime minister. And all of that, that's to say the fact that we have got Boris Johnson as prime minister, chosen by the process that I've just described, is in many ways simply down to the contingencies of politics. And maybe, maybe, that's all you need to know to explain how we've got to where we are that a succession of high political crises and conflicts in the Conservative Party, a succession of battles for the succession, which came out the way they did, has got us uh, to where we are. And one could arguably make exactly the same point with regard uh, to the Labour Party as well. Suppose David Miliband had become leader instead of Ed Miliband. It would have been very different. Labour would have been pro-Remain, there probably wouldn't have been a referendum, and even if there had been a referendum, if David Miliband had been leading the Labour Party, uh, I think uh, Remain would have won. Uh, there would have been no uh, Corbyn as leader, and we would not be where we are now, where Corbyn is still prevaricating as to what he really thinks uh, about Europe. Well, if that's right, and I think it is, that's to say one should always be open to considering alternative possibilities and not to believe that everything is inevitable, then Histoire Yvonne Montiel is much more than just Histoire Yvonne Montiel. The workings of the political process do matter, and this may in fact be the most important explanation of how we have got to where we are, at least perhaps as important as the broader historical perspective I provided earlier on. And my guess, in fact, and of course most historians really agree with this, is that uh, our task in trying to explain how the past is driven forward and how it evolves obliges us both to consider these deep-rooted trends and changes and developments, which in many ways set the limits to what can happen. Uh, but within those limits, what actually happens is also determined by particular de political decisions, particular political personalities, and particular political rivalries. Uh, and it seems to me that we need to put both of these explanatory models together uh, to try to get some understanding as to where we are now and how we've got here, but not, I must repeat, where we're going. So, my final section now, if that's all right, um, reflections and perhaps provocations. What broader considerations do these issues raise? First, it seems to me that one of the prevailing difficulties that we have had over the last three years, and we shall have for the next few months, if not longer, is that whether to remain or whether to leave are much more complicated issues than the simple binary in which they have so often been presented. And not only that, but the arguments don't all line up in the same direction. 
It seems to me absolutely clear that if you think that sovereignty is what matters, then a great deal of British sovereignty has been handed over to Brussels, and if you want to take back control, and if you think you know what that means, then I suppose it's fair to say that leaving the EU is the best way to do it. And it seems to me on its own terms that argument is in a way unanswerable. On the other hand, it seems to me the arguments about peace, prosperity and progress that the EU has certainly helped to deliver, the fact that Britain has actually done well out of the EU and the EU has done well out of Britain, the economic arguments would certainly suggest um, that Remain uh, also has a great deal to be said for it. And of course, what makes the oversimplified uh, and over binary formulation of most of the public discourse on this subject uh, couched in terms of almost absolute and messianic certainty by Remainers and Brexiteers alike. What makes this so uh, inappropriate for the issues with which we are supposed to be trying to struggle is that we can do no more than assess probabilities. We don't know what the impact of Brexit will be. We have some information on it, but we can't be certain. We also don't know what staying in, what Remain would look like 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, the best we can hope to do is to make some sort of judgment about the relative merits of remain, which are good and bad, and the relative merits of leave, which are also good and bad. It's a very, very complicated set of issues which are talked about uh, in adversarial and oversimplified terms which simply fail to do justice to the real complexity of the issues that we face. I don't think that the debate on Brexit uh, has been conducted uh, across three years now at an appropriate level of information or sophistication by politicians uh, or by the media. Second, it seems to me there is a huge confusion in the United Kingdom over the relations between and the justifications for plebiscitary and representative democracy. Plebiscitary democracy, that's to say, referenda. They oversimplify issues, as I've just mentioned. And both Clement Attlee and Margaret Thatcher regarded the recourse to referenda as a sign of weak government. And it's very interesting that the first clause of the federal constitution for Germany, which came into being in the aftermath of the Second World War, banned referenda on major issues because they'd seen where that got you in the 1930s. And we are now in a position where this concept of the will of the people uh, has become um, the mantra uh, of Brexiteers, uh, though the majority was very small. Um, there are a lot of people who had different views then. There may be people who have different views now. Um, and uh, yet it has become something which we are told has to be absolutely observed. Uh, but people may change their minds. Which particular iteration of the will of the people do you take as the one that matters? If there was another referendum, what would the outcome be? I don't know, but it might be for Remain. And what is incontrovertible is that the referendum that happened was very badly thought through. It was another of Cameron's essay crises, and he never quite got to the end of it in time. <laughs> the precedent here uh, is Australia, which had a referendum on whether to keep the monarchy or not. And I think the arrangement that was made was that all the states had to vote the same way, and there had to be a 60-40 margin. And if Cameron wanted his referendum, which I suppose he did, he could have said that. Well, those are the problems with referenda. On the other side, we have what is called representative democracy, famously adumbrated, of course, by Edmund Burke in his letter to the Bristol constituencies in the second half of the 18th century, where he said that MPs were not delegates mandated to do as the voters said. They were representatives who should weigh up the issues on their own terms and then decide. That Parliament made decisions on behalf of the people. It was not mandated by the people what to do. That we pay our MPs to read the 500 pages of the draft agreement that the MPs turned down three times over. We don't expect to read it ourselves. But we now, of course, find ourselves in the position where I think it's fair to say that the majority of MPs and an overwhelming majority of the House of Lords are pro-Remain. So we have a plebiscitary democracy which produces a referendum to leave, we have a representative democracy in which the majority of MPs and peers would probably prefer remain. And if that's not complicated enough, of course, both of the major parties, the Conservatives and Labour, are actually split on this issue. So, uh, this is all a mess. Um, it seems to me, uh, I mean, we can surely all agree on that. <laughs> I should be very worried if that wasn't uh, going to fly, as it were. Um, 
the referendum was not on the current deal and the referendum wasn't on no deal, so should we have another one? I don't know. Uh, in the House of Commons, its views don't reflect those of the majority of people who voted last time. How long does the will of the people last? Is the will of the people now exactly what it was three years ago? Who knows? How do we decide? And if there was a second referendum, what would happen? Uh, nobody knows. Um, I think it's possible that Remain might win. I think it's possible that Brexit would win. Um, if Brexit won, well, then the show, in a sense, would be over. Uh, if Remain won, I think it would produce terrible uh, unrest and uh, disquiet. Uh, and so it is, I think, all a terrible mess. Thirdly, this has huge implications for the Union. And here, of course, I come in every sense very close to home. Remember, England and Wales were pro-Leave, Scotland and Northern Ireland were pro-Remain. Brexit is, I think, a real threat to the continuity of the Union, and ironically, that threat comes from what used to be called the Conservative and Unionist Party. The best way to preserve the Union of the United Kingdom, if you think that's a good idea, is to stay in the European Union. Theresa May got very agitated about this rather late in the day of her prime ministership, but that didn't go anywhere. And, of course, the latest polling suggests that a majority of Tory voters are perfectly willing to see Scotland go if that's a consequence of Brexit, because Brexit is the thing they most want. This is the Chris Patton's point about the Conservative Party now being um, a little England party. So it seems to me it's possible, I don't do the future, but here are some visions of it anyway, it's possible that Scotland may become independent, but that's, of course, up to you, not up to me. It's possible that Northern Ireland will join the South because of the mess up over the border. Uh, and we will then be left with the United Kingdom of England and Wales, um, a force to be reckoned with uh, indeed. <laughs> well, that's what the Welsh are hoping. Uh, I'm sure as a result of that we would lose our seat on the Security Council and have almost no influence in the world at all. That would certainly uh, make uh, the United Kingdom a, a much diminished nation, and those do seem to me to be serious causes for concern. Broader global implications. Brexiteers believe that if Britain emancipates itself from the thraldom of the dead hand of Brussels, we shall once again become the go-ahead nation we were in Victorian time. Well, as I've tried to argue, and as I argue in my book, which I'm, by the way, going to sign uh, copies of after this talk, um, that s it, since the 19th century was a fluke, the notion of going back to that seems to me to be extremely misconceived. And I think this notion that we can somehow get back to 19th century British greatness is misconceived in other ways, too. Partly for the reasons I've just given about the Union. I'm not sure the Union would will survive Brexit. Partly because if we leave the EU, we shall have no influence in Europe. And partly because if we leave Europe, we shall have even less influence in Washington. Uh, see recent events as a foretaste of that. There was a very good piece by Gideon Rackman in the Financial Times a few weekends ago which uh, related to this. For almost 50 years, he wrote, British foreign policy has been based on the twin pillars of a special relationship with the United States and membership of the EU. Without those pillars securely in place, the world looks like a much more dangerous place for Britain. And he went on to point out that in a whole variety of ways now, different power blocks are kind of sensing and feeling out impending British weakness, Trump in his deplorable treatment of the British ambassador, uh, the EU in driving a very hard bargain over leave, Russia in Salisbury, China over Hong Kong, and even Iran are testing just how far what looks as though it's going to be a weakened Britain can be pushed. Well, if that's the future of post-Brexit Britain, which I hope it's not, that's not a happy prospect. So, let me offer some wider perspectives, even wider perspectives, by way of uh, conclusion. It's very tempting to see Brexit as a one-off episode, but of course it's part of a much broader picture. Today, xenophobic nationalism and authoritarian regimes uh, are around to a greater extent than they had been since the 1930s, and we hardly need reminding that the 1930s did not end well. I'm very anxious to say, very anxious to say, that I'm not suggesting that all people who support Brexit are xenophobes or authoritarians, but at its edges, the Brexit movement certainly morphs into that set of attitudes. At the same time, we and all other nations are confronted by problems from global warming to regulating the great internet giants and multinational corporations that cannot be dealt with 
within the geographical confines of the nation state and the temporal limitations of the democratic electoral cycle. That's an argument for having supranational organizations which take a longer view and cover a broader geographical span. So even as xenophobic nationalism becomes more strident and assertive, the countervailing forces undermining the sovereignty of the nation state also become more pronounced. They're kind of equal and opposite reactions. And that seems to me to be why, and not just in this country, but elsewhere, democracy is having a very hard time of things at present, and that is cause for real and serious concern. Because among the many lessons that history teaches, one of them is that democracy is not, not the default mode of political and constitutional organization. And nor, Pace Francis Fukuyama, is it the preordained end point to which all history is leading. It would be nice if it were, but it's not. On the contrary, what we now take for granted as democracy in this country, even if it's not working, Full adult franchise, regular parliamentary elections, and the rule of law are relatively recent inventions of the 19th and 20th century. The majority of countries in the world today still do not have them, and many may never get them. It's easy to take for granted that democracy is here, but it's only here because it's been worked at, and it will only stay here if it's worked at going forward. So... With all its faults and failings and limitations, which I am unhesitatingly willing, of course, to concede, the European Union has helped to bring and safeguard peace and prosperity and democracy to large parts of a European continent which nearly destroyed itself twice during the first half of the 20th century. And if there are any lessons to be learned from the First and the Second World Wars, it's surely those. The world, it seems to me, is a better place because the EU exists. Europe is a better place because the EU exists. And the UK is a better country because it's part of it. I have, as you will notice, just come off the fence. <laughs> and so my final words off the fence are the following. Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump both want to wreck the EU. I do not think we should be doing their business for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's incredibly um, interesting and also pretty ominous, I feel. Um, I think we need the lights up just to help us feel a little more cheerful. There's not a great deal of time, so I wonder if... We could start with questions um, without me even speaking. So chap at the back and lady at the front. And we've got five minutes. So if the questions could be short, that would be so helpful. Um, and lady here, after you, why don't you start? Yes, at the front here. Last week, there was a large electricity brownout in much of England and Wales. Um, we don't be why. Uh, we only have 2% cover now for our electricity industry. We don't have the old CGB, which had nearly 100%. And why? Because the EU doesn't allow state aids. There are lots of reasons for Britain to own some of its critical industries, including the steel industry, which we're just about ready to sell to the Turks. So I do think that the EU has caused us some real problems, apart from in Scotland, the vision. Thank you. Well, as I say, I hold no uh, brief for the perfection of the EU. I think that the issue of the fact that most of our utilities are now owned abroad, and indeed most of everything else in this country is owned abroad, is indeed a very serious one. Um, how far the EU is itself to blame for that uh, is, I think, a very good question, to which I certainly couldn't presume to know the answer. But the issue that you raise speaks, of course, to one of the great paradoxes of Thatcherism and of Margaret Thatcher, that she couldn't decide whether she was a British patriot or a global capitalist. 
Um, and that's, of course, one of the contradictions inherent in much Conservative Party philosophy. I'm not suggesting the Conservative Party is unique in having contradictions in its philosophy, but that's certainly one of them. So, of course, it was Thatcher who privatized all the nationalized industries, which were then bought up by um, countries based outside Britain. And that's, as it were, the explanation for the state of affairs that you very rightly deplore. Now, many of those companies are indeed based in Europe. I don't contest that, but again, you know, I think it's a very complicated set of issues. But that whole contradiction I'd want to repeat between, as it were, English or British or UK nationalism, and of course Thatcher uh, banged that drum very hard under certain circumstances, e.g. the Falklands, but also believing in privatization, you cannot buck the market, global capitalism. She, of course, was such a dominant figure that she could get away with these apparent contradictions as if it was all part of a coherent policy. But, you know, now we are, what, 30 years after Thatcher, we can begin to see that the consequences were not necessarily all good, um, and one of them is the one that you've just described. The gentleman here. Yeah, thanks very much indeed for a fantastic analysis. I know you said you don't deal with the future, but if you were suddenly nominated as head of the Remainers, what would your prescription from here be? Yes, well, I, I suppose I did, uh, as it were, lay myself open to that um, <laughs> question. I think my reply to that is that when I reviewed Hugo Young's brilliant uh, interim biography of Margaret Thatcher, a marvellous book, because Hugo was, of course, a Guardian writer, but he paid Thatcher the compliment of taking her seriously and wrote about her exceptionally well, and the book, I think, came out in 1989. And I reviewed that book and I said, you know, she's the most dominant figure there's been in a very long time. Uh, she is sure to win the next election and be in power for a long time. Well, you know, she was gone within a year. Um, <laughs> so that's the only prediction I've made and I'm not making any more. <laughs> we have time for one more question. I'm so sorry. I think you're going to have a very long signing fee, David, when people ask you questions. We'll have the lady here in the black in front of me. One thing that the long 19th century might potentially have given us and didn't give us was a written constitution. Any comments? I entirely agree. Um, of course, uh, one of the things that's interesting about the British constitution is that it's not written, but it's not unbuilt. Uh, what the, the 19th century did provide was the Palace of Westminster. And the Palace of Westminster was an extraordinary young England uh, articulation of how the British Constitution works. And the grandest rooms are reserved for the monarch, who hardly ever goes there. The next grandest rooms are reserved for the House of Lords, and the accommodation for the House of Commons is pretty low level, and it was elected on a very narrow franchise, and it was a fortress. And that's actually what the 19th century Constitution was thought to be by uh, A.W.N. Pugin. Um, well, it wasn't like that then, and it certainly isn't like that now. What it is like now, of course, nobody really knows. Um, it's fair to say that there are many arguments, and I think they become increasingly convincing, that Britain ought to have a written constitution. Um, the, only the only two countries that don't, I think, are Israel and New Zealand, in addition to Britain. Um, but the problem with having a written constitution is they're very hard to change. Whereas, of course, in the case of the British constitution, we just make it up as we go along. Um, but changing uh, con written constitutions is very difficult. And my wife, who is actually writing a book on all this, um, said that the average life of written constitutions is only about 20 years, and then they're torn up and you start again. And of course, that's much weighed, that average is much inflected by the fact that the American constitution has indeed been around for over 200 years, but that's very, very rare. So while I think in some ways the arguments for a written constitution are quite strong, um, in other ways, of course, there is a case for not having a written constitution. Part of the difficulty, it seems to me, or the challenge of being a historian, and this will be my sign off line, is that we live in a world where pundits and politicians want to keep telling us it's all very simple. It seems to me it's the job of historians to keep saying, no, it's all very difficult, and you ignore difficulties and complexity and nuance, not only at your peril, but at ours as well. And I'll stop there. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> David will be going to the signing tent, which is if you just saw your way through the back of the tent, that's where he's going right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, you must have felt so